than a wicked and hip hop. Bad, bad, and a wicked and So today's lecture uh, is going to be about hash tables and how they are used in a DBMS. So before we get going, uh, of course, we have to talk about some of the administrative things. Uh, project number one will be due on Sunday, September 26th at, as usual, 11.59 p.m. And homework number two, uh, which is about indexes, which uh, we'll cover in, in the next couple of lectures. Um, is going to be released today, so it'll be up on the website, um, and that will be due on Sunday, October 3rd, also at 11.59 p.m. Um, just, again, a reminder about the, the plagiarism warning. Um, your project implementation has to be your own work. Uh, you're not allowed to copy source code from other students, other groups, or on the internet. Um, and please don't publish your implementations on GitHub or otherwise make them publicly available because then, you know, that allows other people to go track them down uh, and, and copy them. And again, uh, if you're confused, uh, you can take a look at the, at the academic integrity policy or if you have a question about anything, please contact me or one of the TAs or post on Piazza and, and just ask for clar clarification because it's better that you know we can address it beforehand rather than having to find out afterwards and then deal with it then. Uh, and the last thing um, uh, is the uh, database tech talks that, that we're having this semester. Um, so they, they take place Mondays uh, at 4.30 right after class on Zoom. Uh, today's talk is going to be uh, from someone from uh, Google Napa. Um, next week we'll have someone from TileDB, and then the, the week after that, someone from Bodo. So uh, again, feel free, uh, if you're interested in this stuff, to, to uh, check it out, join the Zoom. Um, everyone's welcome, uh, and it's kind of a cool way to see how some of the, the topics that we're covering in the course uh, get applied in the real world. Uh, oh, there's one more thing. Um, I, I got an anonymous question before class. Um, in the last class, I mentioned that the, the student that um, had the highest, the most amount of uh, uh, extra credit points from the projects would receive um, a bus tub t-shirt. And I made the comment that uh, it um, could potentially help uh, w when you're on the dating scene. Um, I, so the, the question was uh, about whether or not that was uh, due to causation or correlation, uh, and the answer is I don't know. Um, we've, we've never collected any data on that, so I, I honestly can't say. Um, so I think what we'll have to do this, this semester is whoever wins, uh, we'll just have to have you fill out some you know, survey or something at the end so we can collect some data from before and after you have the shirt so we can, you know, for future, um, sections of the course, we can be more accurate about that. So um, I hope that addresses any, any uh, questions about that. So um, in terms of the course, um, today we're going to talk about or start talking about how uh, to support um, kind of the, the DBMS's execution engine to read and write data from pages. So kind of we've been talking about the, the lower levels of the stack, now we're going to move up the stack to uh, this, this access methods piece. Uh, we've already talked about disk manager and the, the buffer pool manager and how all that works. Uh, so now we're kind of right here in the middle. And the two types of data structures, uh, there are many others, especially if you take um, more uh, uh, advanced database courses or look into more advanced systems. There are many other types of data structures, pretty much the two um, fundamental ones and the ones we're going to cover in this course uh, are hash tables and, and trees. So today, today uh, we're going to be talking about hash tables. So data structures uh, can be used in a whole bunch of different places in the DBMS. And they're gonna be used for a lot of different purposes. For example, um, they can be used to store internal metadata. We've seen some cases where uh, we use different, you know, either a page directory or a page table to kind of perform mappings between 
um, pages uh, in their physical locations or tuples in their physical locations. We've seen kind of that use of them. Um, they can be used for core data storage. So for example, you could have you know, pages uh, or groups of pages organized as hash tables. So you could have your actual table organized as uh, in, in some sort of data structure. Uh, they could be used as temporary data structures. So uh, you can think about it like during uh, query execution, um, there are different operations where you might want to build a data structure on the fly and then um, uh, just kind of use that temporarily. Um, and then you know, it, it gets used for the duration of the query uh, and then thrown away. So for example, during like a hash join. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, we've talked a little bit about kind of how uh, you can use data structures as table auxiliary table indexes. So you can kind of have your, your core data storage in, the, in a table file and you can build an index on top of it to make accessing it um, a little bit easier. So kind of the, the two key design decisions that we need to make um, when, when designing data structures are the data organization how is the data you know, physically laid out? What are the different trade-offs we need to consider there? As well as concurrency. So we've talked a lot about you know, if you have multiple uh, concurrent transactions or queries running in the system, how can you um, uh, ensure that, that uh, the data or data structures are um, accessed or not modified uh, concurrently, uh, causing problems with multiple access? So um, we're first going to focus kind of on this organization piece. Um, just to, to simplify the discussion, we're going to assume everything. For the most part, uh, there, there'll be a, a few cases where we discuss concurrency. But for the most part, we're going to assume um, for now that everything's single threaded. Uh, and then we'll talk kind of more about this multi-threaded uh, stuff when, when uh, we discuss concurrency control in, in later lecture in the course. So as I said, uh, today's lecture is going to be all about hash tables. So basically a hash table, uh, I'm sure many of you may be familiar with it from you know, a data structures course or an algorithms course or something, but uh, basically a hash table implements um, an associative array from you know, some, some key to some values. So you have a, a set of keys, you want to map them to some set of values, so you give the hash table a key it gives you back the corresponding value associated with that key. And the way it does that is it uses a, a hash function in order to compute uh, basically an index or an offset into some array uh, for, for a given key. And then you can retrieve the uh, associated value with that key. So the space complexity for this is ON. It uh, scales with the size of the, the number of keys that you're storing. And the time, complex, uh, time complexity, depending on how we implement it, the average time complexity is O1, and the worst case time complexity is ON. We have to look at every single item in order to retrieve, uh, the, find the key that we're looking for. So uh, I, you may know this you know, from, from the theory perspective, but in practice, a lot of times, what we care about are the constants associated with this. So these, these are, are perfectly fine uh, complexity um, assessments for you know the the abstract idea of a hash table but if you have for example on the order of a billion keys and there's a, uh, a you know look up overhead of one second per key or something even though it's constant time that that you know one second adds up a billion times so um, we really need to care not just about the the time complexity of these operations but specifically about um, kind of the constants, the constant factors that go along with each lookup. So kind of the, the easiest, most basic hash table that you can uh, think about is just to allocate, you know, this giant array that has one slot for every element or key that you want to store. So uh, for example, just think about the keys like uh, integers and we have uh, between zero and n. Um, and we want to, you know, slot each key into a, an individual slot. We can do this by modding the key by the number of elements that we're storing, and then we can find the offset in the array. So, for example, let's say we have this, these um, uh, strings in here. So we have ABC, null, 
uh, DEF, and so forth. Um, the way that we can can find these again is to to uh, perform the hash, and that tells us brings us to the uh, associated um, uh, value stored with that key. So hash of the key modded by the number of um, elements in the array gives us the offset that that we're looking for. So there are some assumptions that this simple um, model makes. Uh, the first is uh, that you know the number of elements that you want to store ahead of time. Uh, some cases that might be true, you know, you know, I have a billion elements, I have a million elements, whatever it is. Uh, that's all I ever need to store in the hash table. In a lot of cases that might not be true, for example, if you think about um, a, a database table that can, you know, grow arbitrarily large, so we may need to continue adding keys over time. Um, Another assumption that's made here is that each key is unique, so you can't have, for example, duplicate keys. Of course, in SQL, which is a bag or multi-set algebra, uh, we allow these sorts of duplicate keys. Um, so we, we that that assumption isn't isn't sufficient for for uh, a lot of cases. And finally, this this kind of assumes a, a perfect hash function. So here. Um, if key one doesn't equal key two, then the hash of key one isn't going to equal the hash of key two. So that means each hash function uniquely maps a key to some position in this uh, array, which um, it's, it's unrealistic uh, to kind of devise sort of this, this perfect hash function that's not going to have any collisions. So when, when we're thinking about designing a more practical hash table, um, we have sort of these, these two design decisions that we have to make, and this is what a hash table is at its core. The first design decision is what type of hash function are we going to use? So how are we going to map the large key space, potentially a, a really large key space, if you have you know, really large integers or strings or something, how can you map a very large key space into a much smaller domain, which is the um, array or, or storage that you're storing it in? Uh, and finally, we want to have this kind of balance, this trade-off uh, between being really fast to compute so we can, you know, compute the hash really quickly versus having a lot of collisions. So, um, you know, if you, if you just take, for example, the identity function um, that's really fast to compute, you don't have to do anything, you just return the key. But um, if you have a high number of duplicates in your data, then that's, that's going to be, uh, end up with a lot of collisions in your, your uh, hash table. So that's kind of the first piece is the, the hash function. And then the second, the second piece really has to do with collisions, which is what, what your hashing scheme is going to be. So how do you handle um, any collisions that are produced by your hash function? And again, kind of there's this trade-off here. In this case, it's between allocating uh, a really large hash table so you can trade off memory or disk, uh, depending on where, where your hash table lives. But uh, you can kind of trade off space for additional instructions or performing additional work, um, compute time to, to find and insert keys. So kind of in both of these cases, we have to consider way these trade-offs and uh, a lot of the different schemes that we'll look at today um, will have different ways of balancing these uh, different trade-offs. So uh, the, this whole lecture is going to be about, you know, kind of all the different aspects of building uh, hash tables. We're going to start again at the first, the first design decision, which is what your hash function is going to be, and then we'll look at different um, hashing schemes. First, static hashing schemes. So those are fixed size um, uh, tables that are allocated versus dynamic hashing schemes, which try to trade off uh, this this larger or um, uh, you know kind of uh, uh, batch allocation versus a more incremental allocation of space for the hash table. So again, kind of the, the idea behind a hash function is that uh, for any input key, we want to return some integer representation of that key. So we could be taking a key uh, uh, as an integer. Uh, the keys could be integers. We want to return an integer that represents some you know, hashed version of that key. Uh, it could be a string where you use you know, the different characters in the string to somehow compute your hash function. It could be an arbitrary data type uh, of uh, bytes. So basically what we want to do is just take this input key and somehow return a, a hashed integer representation of that. 
So uh, you may be familiar with like cryptographic hash functions. Uh, we don't want to use those for this case. Um, cryptographic hash functions have a lot of properties that are nice for uh, cryptography or cryptographic use cases, but uh, they're pretty slow usually and, and we don't need those properties um, for uh, implementing the, the hash tables inside of DDMS. So basically what we want is a hash function that is really fast to execute. So we wanna be able to get the hash of our keys quickly uh, and has a low collision rate. We don't want you know, a lot of, uh, we don't want the hash function to return the same hash values for uh, many different keys. So uh, this is just a, a, a few popular uh, hash functions. Um, CRC64 has been around for a while. Um, it, it, there, are, there are fast implementations of this for modern CPUs. Um, I think it was originally used in networking, like error detection, uh, computing a checksum, error detection and networking. Um, kind of the, the uh, number of hash functions uh, for this type of use case seems to have exploded in the last, I don't know, 15 or, or 10, 15, 20 years. Uh, I think because um, as more things have moved into memory, it's become increasingly important to have kind of these fast um, hash functions with few collisions. So a lot of effort um, has, been, has been put into this. One popular one is Murmur hash. Uh, there are several different versions uh, by now. There's like Murmur hash three now um, is the, the most recent version, but um, that's kind of designed as a fast general purpose hash function. A lot of systems use that. Um, and then there are, there are several from uh, uh, Google, Facebook, and other companies like that uh, that are kind of designed uh, for different use cases. So for example, the city hash is designed to be faster for shorter keys. You think like, I don't know, email addresses or something that are smaller than 64 bytes that, that Google has um, a use case for. So uh, there are kind of all these different, more specialized hash functions, but, um, uh, murmur hash is, is a pretty popular one. So uh, just as a, a, you know, kind of a, a high level comparison between um, the different functions I showed. Uh, so these, uh, it just shows the throughput uh, in terms of how many, how many uh, megabytes per second each hash function can execute. Uh, you'll see CRC64 is somewhere low along the bottom, uh, it's pretty slow. Um, there are, uh, so the, the, the x-axis is the key size, so the number of bytes uh, that, that, uh, in the key. Uh, and you'll see kind of these, uh, for, for some of the functions, you'll see kind of these spikes. Um, those are usually like if they're cache line aligned or word aligned um, on the number of bytes, you, you kind of get up there and then when you're you know, one byte too far over, uh, the, the performance drops off. Uh, so kind of this is, this is the, the um, uh, uh, high level comparison to see kind of, you know, depending on which hash function you choose, you can get a pretty different um, performance. So the, the second piece to um, the hash table, and this is the, the probably the more complicated piece, is, is what hashing scheme are you going to use? So we'll talk kind of about three uh, different approaches here. Um, the first is called linear probe hashing, the second is Robinhood hashing, and the third uh, is cuckoo hashing. And this is again the, the uh, hashing scheme that you're going to use uh, for how to resolve collisions. So uh, linear uh, probe hashing uh, is, is also called open address hashing. hashing. Um, we'll see why uh, in a second, but uh, basically you can think of it, you just have a, a single giant table of slots, so like a, a big array. Um, and the way that we're going to resolve collisions is by linearly searching forward in the array for the next free slot. So. Again, imagine you have two uh, keys that hash to the same position. There's a collision there, so in order to, to find uh, if, if the first key that we've come across isn't uh, the key we're looking for, then we're going to scan until we find um, the next key. So kind of to, to determine whether or not there's an element present, we're gonna hash the location in the index and then scan forward for it. Um, 
And uh, if, if we, we get to a position that's empty in our array, then we, we know we're done, we're going to stop scanning. So insertions and deletions are kind of just a, a generalization of how you do lookup. So we'll kind of walk through next uh, just a basic example to kind of see how this works. So again, uh, let's say we want to hash these keys here, um, uh, A through F, and we have our uh, allocated hash table. It's just a whole bunch of, of uh, buckets. Um, so that we'll you know, hash the first one. So we're going to store uh, the, hash, the hash value gives us uh, position two in the table. So it's going to be A stored there, which is the key we're looking for, as well as the value associated with uh, A. So the, the, you know, there are different ways you can do it, but one common way is to just store the keys uh, contiguous with the values. So these are both stored together in the hash table, so that way when we want to go retrieve it, we can get the, the value back um, as, as soon as we find the key. So again, we can kind of go through this. B maybe hashes to the zeroth position. We store the key B as well as the value. We can keep going, and we get to C here, we see that there is a uh, collision. So what C does is the hash maps the key C to the same position as key A. So the way we're going to resolve it, this is why it's called uh, linear probe hashing, is uh, we just kind of scan linearly forward from the position that C should have been inserted until we find the next open position um, in the array. So kind of C ends up there, and then if we insert D, uh, it's the same procedure. D maps to the position, uh, D maps to the position where C was inserted, so now that slot's full, so we have to scan forward until we find an empty slot for D, uh, and you know, so on. So now we end up with E here, that's all the way back up where, where A was, so we're gonna kinda look at each next slot, you see C uh, is in the next position, then D, so finally E gets uh, put at the bottom of the array there, and kind of again with F, F goes in, uh, or F should be inserted, F hashes to the position where E is stored, um, and we get F stored you know, consecutively after E. So this is kind of the, how, the, how the insertion procedure here works, it's really straightforward. Uh, you don't need to keep track of anything, really. You just hash to the position that uh, you're, you're supposed to be in. If there's already a key in that position, then you just scan forward until you find um, an empty slot to insert into. And you don't need any, like, uh, um, you know, latching or anything for this. You can just do, like, a, uh, an atomic compare and swap operation, a compare and set operation uh, to insert into, into the... Um, slot, and if you fail, you know, if your atomic operation fails, you can go to the next slot. You can implement it with, with latching, but you can equally implement it with just atomic instructions. Um, okay, so that's kind of the, the insertion procedure. Uh, does, that, does that make sense? Does anyone have any questions about that part? Yes? What about quadratic hashing? So the question is, what about quadratic hashing? Um, yeah, so uh, linear, linear probing is kind of the, the simplest one. It's just inserting consecutive elements. Uh, you could have an, an arbitrary uh, probing scheme for your hash table. Uh, you could do it like exponentially. You could do it quadratically. So you know, first you check the first, next first space. Uh, then you check two, four, etc. cetera. Um, it depends on the distribution of your keys and the insertion order of the keys. So uh, there, if, if you know information about that, there may be reasons uh, to, to choose different um, probing schemes. Um, the, the challenge with uh, nonlinear probing is, again, remember, uh, we've talked a lot about the cost of uh, random access versus sequential access. So uh, if you have, you know, let's say exponential, if you have uh, to jump to the second, and then the fourth, and then the eighth, and so on, then you can kind of uh, wind up with these bad random access patterns, especially if, um, you know, with, with just linear sequential scan, um, not only is data, you know, it, it's in consecutive, if it's stored in pages, it's in consecutive pages. Uh, if it's stored in memory, then it could be in consecutive cache lines. Um, and th there's also some prefetching that can go on. So it's usually a lot cheaper 
um, to do these kind of linear uh, scans. So th there are there are other um, probing algorithms, but um, pretty much uh, most of the time, I think, unless you know something about kind of the key distribution, then linear probing is is uh, common. Yes. Uh, so the question is, why don't we need latching for this portion? So um, you you could implement the these insertions with latches. You could take a latch. I mean, at the in the most extreme case, you could take a latch in the whole data structure and insert one thing to prevent concurrent modifications. Um, it, you could take latches on individual bins or buckets in the hash table um, to prevent concurrent modification. Uh, since since we're just inserting into an individual slot. So like here, F wants to insert into this individual slot. You can just perform one atomic instruction to try and, and set the F, uh, or to insert the F key into that slot. And if, if the atomic, like a, like a compare and swap or compare and set function. So if you, if you compare it to empty and uh, the, the, the bucket is empty, so in this case, it's, it's gonna start out at E, that's not going to be empty. You're going to move to the next one. So let's say F now issues the, the compare and set for, uh, to insert itself. And maybe G comes along in the meantime and, and you know, inserts G in there. So the, the compare and set function is going to fail for F. And then it will just move on to the next uh, uh, slot in the bin. Does that make sense? Yes. Great. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, yes, so the question is, uh, do, do, do the insertions wrap around and go back to the um, uh, beginning if it reaches the end? Uh, the answer is yes, you can think about this like a circular buffer. So uh, kind of, you know, a, as, you're, as you're going through here, if another key G came along uh, and you got back to the beginning, or sorry, you got down to the end where F is, um, you, you may need to wrap around back to the beginning and start, start your scan from there. So uh, if, if this, fills up, and we'll see that in a second, but if this, if the data structure fills up, then you're going to kind of complete an entire complete loop through um, the, the uh, hash table. So when you get back around to the position, the first position that you started in, the position you hashed to, you know that the, um, the hash table is full and you need to resize it. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a few slides. Are there any other questions? Great. Okay. So um, the next, the next. So that that was inserts and uh, lookups work sort of the same way. Um, so now the piece that we need to to consider is deletion. So we want to remove a key from the hash table. Um, uh, let's say, for example, we want to remove key C. So we'll delete that, and we'll you know hash the val hash C. It brings us to. Uh, uh, position slot number uh, two, and that's where A is stored, so we compare C to A, that doesn't match, so then we scan forward one, we find C, and then we can just delete C, right? Does anyone see a problem with what I just did there? Yes? Later on, if trying to uh, do a lookup for like, a computer function that happens to A, it'll see the gap Right, so the, the, um, the, the comment was that if you have another uh, value that, or another key that hashes to the position uh, where A is stored, and then, you know, let's say it's key E or, or D, and then you want to scan forward, then uh, what's going to happen is you're going to see the empty slot and you're going to assume you're done, right? And that's exactly correct. Uh, so for example, if we want to find key D, now, after we've performed this deletion, uh, key D is going to hash into this um, empty slot, and it's going to say, "Hey, there's no, there's no key there. It's not, you know, it's not my key D. It's not some other key, and I need to scan forward now. There's just no key, so it, it thinks that uh, D is not included in the hash table, even though we can see, you know, D is in the very next position." So the way we get around this is uh, there, there are, are two strategies. The first um, approach is what's called using a tombstone. So you uh, insert some tombstone value. It's just you know some reserved value. Could be a bit flag, could be some reserved key value, whatever. Um, 
Basically, all it does, its only purpose is to be inserted into that position where we removed C uh, in order to let subsequent lookups know that there, uh, it's not an empty bin or not an empty slot, it's actually just a removed or deleted slot. Since we removed it, we don't care what the, the value or the, what the key, we don't care what key used to be stored in there. All we care about is knowing that uh, there, there used to be some key stored in this position. So we don't, we don't terminate our uh, forward scan early. So we can kind of see if we, if we have uh, this lookup of D again, it goes to the, the slot with the tombstone and it says, okay, uh, I, I know there's a tombstone here, I need to start scanning forward from this position, and then you, you find um, the next value D. So the, the second approach that you can use to get around this is um, what's called movement, so it's basically like a, a compaction phase. So for example, um, in this case, if we removed uh, C, we can just kind of slide all of these other values up uh, and now fill in you know, the empty missing uh, uh, hole that we created. Um, and now again, we'll find D, we can hash in and find the value there. Yes? When we're doing that movement, uh, how do we know when to stop moving them? Like, say F was in its position because it should be there, like that's where it maps to, how would we know not to move that? So the, the question is, um, when we're performing the movement, um, the compaction, uh, how do you know when to stop sliding things up? Because for example, F might be in its uh, correct slot, but something else might not be. Um, that's the, the you know, next point I was going to make. Uh, so kind of uh, in this particular example, kind of the mappings work correctly. Um, but if, for example, we had you know, an, another uh, key, where in your example, F was in the correct position, uh, what we would need to do is figure out, okay, we can't slide F up because it maps to the correct area. So what this ends up doing is basically rehashing everything below uh, where your compaction is. So you perform uh, for the slots uh, below where you're compacting, you wanna perform that uh, a rehashing to see if they're in the correct position. Does that make sense? So for example, uh, let's say we wanna move D up. We rehash D and you basically just reinsert it. Does that answer the question? Yeah, so the, 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 basically when you're doing this compaction, it triggers a rehashing of everything uh, below the empty slot that you're uh, reinserting. So for example, in this case, if F uh, was in the correct position at the bottom, then we, when we rehashed F, it would just map to that position again. It, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't move it up. Are there any other questions about that? So again, we have to, we have to uh, kind of be, be mindful about um, this being a, a circular buffer, uh, which we, we uh, just mentioned uh, in one of the previous questions. So uh, when we were doing the, the um, shifting or, or sliding, kind of, we would have to look at B, which is at the top of, of the array here. And really it should be shifted down there since we're shifting everything up by one um, to fill in the slots. And kind of as, as uh, uh, we just discussed, this, this, if we're hashing the key B, it's expected to be there, but uh, when we're doing the shifting, we would have to move it up. So again, you have to kind of be careful. You can't always move all of the keys. Uh, you essentially have to do a rehashing of all of the keys in the partition that you are um, uh, shifting. Okay, so uh, another issue that can come up um, in, in uh, with the, with the uh, kind of basic or naive uh, version of the hash table is it can't support, remember, non-unique keys. So again, if we have um, this bag or multi-set algebra, how do we handle uh, keys that are uh, duplicates in the data set? So uh, kind of one option is to have this uh, separate linked list 
which is just going to store basically a, a, a list of all of the values that are related to a particular key. So you kind of deduplicate the common keys and then just store all of the values in um, a value list, basically. So uh, in this example, uh, the key XYZ, uh, there are three repeats of the key XYZ, each with different values, and two repeats of the key ABC um, with different values. So we can kind of store each of the keys once in our, in our hash table, and then we just store this pointer to some value list uh, that can store variable sized um, number of values depending on how many, how many duplicates of the key, each key we have. Um, kind of the, the other approach to this is that we can just store uh, the duplicate key entries together in the hash table, um, and then we have to modify our, our lookup algorithm a little bit, but uh, basically kind of we can just get these uh, uh, values stored um, together in the hash tables, and then when we go to do the lookups, we, we can retrieve them. But that, again, requires us to modify the lookup algorithm um, to, uh, we have to scan until we find a, uh, an empty slot because now we don't know uh, when necessarily we're done. We have to keep scanning until we, we could potentially find more keys. Um, for example, if we're looking for the key XYZ, in, in this case, um, there could be you know, uh, other XYZ keys later in the hash table. We have to keep scanning until we find all of them. We can't stop after we found the first one. So are there any questions about uh, non-unique keys? Yes? So for the second approach, like when you set back the value, you just set back all the value values, right? So the question is, uh, in the second approach, when you get back all of the, uh, when you get back the values for a specific key, do you get back all of the values? So uh, the answer is yes, but it actually applies to, to both approaches. So in the first approach, uh, whatever it is, whether it's the first approach or the second approach, if you look up a key and there are multiple values associated, so what multiple values associated with the key means is that uh, the keys are duplicated. So um, you'll, if there are, th if, if the key XYZ is duplicated three times, you'll get back three values when you look up XYZ. And it doesn't matter if, if you're storing it the first way in these value lists or if you're storing it the second way, just kind of all together in the, the hash table. So um, does it mean like when you search for a specific key, you always need to go to the whole list? In the case of you are not sure if you have to use that all the keys. So the, uh, about the second, uh, yeah. So the question is uh, when you have the, the redundant keys all stored in the hash table, choice number two, um, when you do a lookup, do you have to scan through the whole hash table uh, because you don't know when, um, you know, like you don't know you don't know when you're you're done. Um, so it's not necessarily the whole hash table unless I guess the hash table is full, but you have to scan until you find an explicitly empty bin because you don't know uh, like if if there are guaranteed to be unique keys, you can stop as soon as you find the key you're looking for, right? If there are duplicate keys, you don't know. I, I mean, it could be X, Y, Z, and then A, B, C a hundred times, and then another X, Y, Z again, right? So you don't know um, when to stop until you hit one of these empty uh, bins. So then you know that, that your scanning is over, you don't have to go any further. Does that make sense? Right. Yes. So the question is, um, if you have duplicate keys, does the hash table uh, always return the, uh, all, all of the values or does it just return the first one? Um, I, I mean, so I guess you, you could implement it either way. Uh, probably what I would imagine uh, it would look like is you'd get an iterator to like uh, an arbitrarily sized list of values and it could be one or it could be n. Um, yeah, I think that's a, an implementation decision uh, that you'd have to make depending on how you how you want the values. So you you could, uh, yeah, you could do it either way. Um, but I think the 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 thing to keep in mind is that um, when 
when we're, we're building these, in a lot of cases, we can't guarantee that they're going to be unique keys. So we need to figure out some way to handle uh, these, these variable size number of values uh, for duplicate keys. Does that make sense? Great. Okay, are there any other questions about this? Okay, so uh, that was linear probe hashing. The next one, uh, the next hashing scheme we're going to talk about is called Robin Hood hashing. Um, it's named after uh, Robin Hood, the outlaw from English folklore, uh, who you may be familiar with. He stole from the rich and, and gave uh, to the poor. And kind of the, the algorithm is, um, t gets its name from, from that kind of uh, idea. So it's, it's basically a variant of linear probe hashing that's going to steal slots from rich keys, and uh, I'll explain what a rich key is in a minute, and give them to poorer keys. Um, so basically each key is going to track the number of positions that they are from where they should have been inserted in the hash table. So uh, if you think about on the, the previous slides, when you have a collision, sometimes we had to scan forward to find uh, an empty slot to insert a key into. So basically each key is tracking the number of positions um, that you had to scan forward in order to find the empty slot. And what's going to happen is on, on insert in the, the Robinhood algorithm, uh, a key will take the slot of another key if the first key is farther away from its optimal position than the second key. So uh, we'll, we'll kind of go through a, a visual example of this. I think it'll be uh, easier to understand. So, Again, we have these keys here and we have our, our hash table. Um, we're going to hash key A and that goes at, at offset two. Uh, and what we're storing now, in addition to the key A and the value, uh, we're also storing this number of jumps from the first position. So A got inserted into exactly the spot where we, we, uh, the hash function said it should be inserted. So that has a value of zero. So, now our next key B, again, we insert the key B as well as the associated value, as well as the number of jumps since the first position, so that's zero. Key C here, uh, well, C and A have a collision, but in this case, A is zero slots since it's, uh, uh, A has a, a value of zero in its jump position. C also has a value uh, of zero in its jump position, they're equal. So we're, we're not going to replace key A. We're going to move C down to this slot and we're going to insert it uh, with a, a jump value of one. So we have this value one now because C was inserted one position away from where the hash function said it should be. So D, let's say hashes to, to this uh, case here. We're going to see that uh, C is, has a jump position of one D has a jump position of zero, so C is greater than D. Uh, we're not going to replace C. We're going to insert D here with a, a, a jump position of one. Uh, and now we have E, which is going to hash to, let's say, uh, the, the slot where A is stored. So at this point, A uh, is equal to zero and E is equal to zero, so we're not going to replace A. Uh, C is equal to one and E is equal to one, so we're not going to replace C. Uh, now we see that D is equal to one, which is richer or uh, closer to where it should be than E, which is now equal to two, because we've had to do these two jumps from where we said uh, E should be inserted. So in this case, we're going to replace D with E and store uh, the, the two jumps in the, the jump position. And then we're going to ins insert D right below it with uh, also two jumps in the jump position. So now, again, just to finish, F comes along. Um, D has two, F has zero, so F is going to go in that, that uh, bottom slot. So kind of the, the, this algorithm um, is shown to like reduce the, the variance in, in the key displacement. So that means the number of jumps or the number of uh, positions, um, the key, uh, the insertion position is from where the hash function says it should be. 
Um, so it, it's, it, it reduces the variance and the displacement relative to uh, linear hashing. All of this depends on you know, when the keys arrive. Uh, so this, this depends on the order that we inserted the keys. If we inserted them in a different order, we'd, we'd get a different answer. Um, usually this, this isn't very efficient in practice um, due to uh, all of the branch mispredictions that you have with the comparisons and then the, the excessive copying. So usually um, in practice, uh, people tend to implement just, just plain linear hashing uh, and then you know, deal with the, the um, uh, less advantageous theoretical aspects. But um, this, this is kind of how the, the uh, Robin Hood hashing scheme works. So are there any questions about this? I know it was uh, a little bit complicated to walk through here, but uh, any questions? Great. Okay, so we've seen linear probing, we've seen Robin Hood hashing. Uh, the next one we're gonna talk about is called cuckoo hashing. Uh, it's basically just an alternative way to deal with collisions relative to um, the other two. Um, basically, the, the key idea is that we're going to use, instead of one hash table, a single hash table, we're going to use multiple hash tables, each with either a different hash function or some different hash seed um, that, that uh, will give us different uh, hash mappings for keys in each of the tables that we have. So on insert, what we're going to do is check every table and pick any one of them that has a, a free slot for us to do the insertion. Uh, if no table is a free slot, then we're going to go through this eviction process until we get um, all of the keys where they need to go. And again, we'll go through a visual example of this. I think it'll be a little bit easier to understand. Um, but what you end up with is the lookups and the deletions are always 01 um, because we only have to look at one location per hash table. So rather than um, uh, kind of having to do these scans, we only end up looking in one location per hash table for each uh, hash table that we have. Um, if you're wondering where the name comes from, uh, it's named after the, the cuckoo bird, uh, which is a type of bird where some of the species um, will lay their eggs in another bird's nest and then the, the uh, birds when they hatch uh, kick the, the other um, eggs out of the nest or the other, the other baby birds out of the nest. It's a little uh, gruesome, but that's, that's where the name comes from. So um, basically uh, what, what we're um, trading off here is we're making writes more expensive, so we have to do this multiple hashing um, in order to have faster reads. So that's the trade-off uh, that's going on here. So in the visual example, um, for simplicity, we're just gonna show two hash tables. Uh, in practice, it's usually more, I think, uh, the default for the, the libcuckoo one, which I showed the, the open source implementation from CMU, uh, is three, three tables get used. Um, but uh, here it's just two for ease of illustration. So uh, imagine, again, here we wanna insert um, key A. So we have these two tables, each with its own hash functions. What we're going to do is evaluate uh, the hash of A twice. So hash function one of A, hash function two of A, and that's going to map to two different positions um, in, in these hash tables. So uh, let's say we're going to stick A in, in hash table one because the slot's empty, so we insert uh, the key A and the value. Uh, now let's come to um, key B, we want to insert key B, we again do hash function one for the first hash table, hash function two for the second hash table, uh, and we get these two positions, let's say. So we have a collision in hash table one for key B, we already have key A stored in that slot, so what we're going to do is insert B into hash table number two because the slot's empty. So A wound up in hash table number one, B wound up in hash table number two. Now key C comes along, and again, we do the same two hash functions. Let's say we find out that key C maps to this position in the first hash table and to, uh, uh, with that, that has uh, key A already stored there, and it also maps to the position in the second hash table that has key B stored there. 
So what do we do? We have two collisions. We don't know where, uh, there's, there's nowhere uh, that's empty for us to insert it. So we're going to have to choose one of the values to replace. So let's replace uh, uh, the key B in hash table number two. So we're gonna kick out key uh, B and insert key C there. So now we have to do something with key B. So we're gonna rerun hash one because we removed it from hash table two. Um, we're gonna rerun hash one on key B. That's gonna tell us to go to this slot uh, where key A is currently stored. So now we have to kick out uh, key A from hash table one, replace it with key B. And now we end up here with, with uh, uh, key A. We have to find a place for that to go. Uh, since we removed it from hash table one, we'll go and try and insert it in hash table two. So that's going to hash us uh, to, to this position, which is empty, and key A can, can go in there. Yes? What if we plot the instant loop, like for example, if hash two of A goes back to A? Uh, so the question is, what happens if you end up in sort of a loop where, uh, for example, um, the hash two of A goes back to the position C? Uh, so the answer is that uh, you need some kind of a check to see if uh, you're in this sort of loop. So are you back to the key that you started with? Um, if that's the case, then what you need to do is uh, rehash everything. So either you, uh, you know, grow the size of the hash tables, you could add another, another table, you could change your hash function, whatever it is. But Kind of you, if, if you run into this case where there's nowhere left to uh, insert a key, then you have to, to rehash all of the keys to find, to make sure that uh, every key fits somewhere in some hash table in, in an empty slot. Yes? So if you mentioned cycles, would you actually have to like keep track of the path you're using to rehash the, the key and so that the detect cycles? And So the, the question is, um, if you're in this sort of loop, do you have to keep track of the, uh, uh, your path through the, the insertions to figure out uh, if, you're in, if you have a cycle in the, the path? Um, I, I don't think so. I think you can just keep track of if you've returned to the, the key that you started, or I guess, so, Yeah, so I think, I, I, I was just trying to think if you could end up with a, like a local cycle, like a, you know, A and B keep. Um, I guess it would depend on the implementation. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think um, you, you should just be able to see if you are, end up back at the key that you started with again, because then you'll know that there's no kind of mapping um, there's no like there's no way of arranging them or distributing them in different tables that will get you for in this case it's a b and c that will get you those uh, values distributed so i think i think you can just keep track of you know whatever key you were inserting in this case the uh, key c and if if you ever wind up back there then you know that that there's no way of arranging the keys that is going to work yes Uh, sorry, so the question is, in the worst case, you might end up redoing? Yeah, the, all the tables uh, in all the elements, and then you realize this is like Right. Uh, so the, the question is, um, in the worst case, can you end up uh, go, kind of going through and, and kicking out and replacing all of the elements and all of the tables, and then in the end, you realize anyway that there's no... Um, Distribution. Yes, that can happen. So, in the, I guess in the worst case, um, you end up kind of with this uh, total rebalancing anyway. Um, and if if you kind of have to go through the whole process of doing, I guess uh, there may be some theory. I, I, I'm not familiar with with all the theory behind this, but there may be some theory about you know the number of expected collisions that you end up with um, in a rebalancing, depending on the size of the hash tables, number of hash tables, and like the overlap in the, the collisions.
but that's, that's certainly a possibility, yes. Are there any other questions? Okay, so um, one observation that you might make is that uh, all of the uh, previous hash tables that we talked about um, require the DBMS to, to know the number of elements that it wants to store in advance. So when we allocate this array, we allocate a fixed size n, and um, that's, that's how many elements we can store. Uh, and then to grow or shrink the array, we kind of have to rebuild uh, everything from scratch, we have to rehash all the elements to make sure they go to the correct um, bins or buckets in the next, uh, the, the uh, resized array. Um, so sometimes this assumption holds, sometimes you can know this. So for example, like during query processing, if you're doing something like a hash join, um, then you can know or maybe estimate um, or have an upper bound on the number of keys that are going to be, or the number of distinct keys that are going to show up in your um, uh, query. But there are a lot of times that you know, you, this assumption might not hold. So for example, if you have like just the, the base table storage, um, your data can grow arbitrarily large. So you could always be inserting new keys, uh, and over time that might fill up your hash table and, and you're out of room. So you have to kind of rebuild it um, uh, from scratch. So ideally what we'd like is a way to, uh, for those latter cases where we don't know uh, the, the ultimate size of the hash table, the number of keys that we need to store, um, we'd like ideally some way to grow or shrink the table incrementally without having to um, completely rebuild it. So that's kind of where this idea of dynamic hash tables comes in, um, where they're uh, resizing themselves on demand. And we're going to talk about three uh, different ways of doing this. Uh, chained hashing, extendable hashing, and linear hashing. So the, the first approach is called chained hashing. Uh, basically, we're going to maintain a linked list of buckets for each slot in the hash table. And we're going to resolve collisions um, by, by placing all elements with the same hash key into the same bucket. So uh, sometimes it's called like a bucketed hash table. Um, this, is, this is probably the most common one and the one most, most people are familiar with. Um, you can grow the hash table infinitely uh, just by adding new buckets to the, the linked list. Um, and you only need to take a latch or use some you know, uh, atomic operation like a, a lock-free operation. Um, to store a new entry or extend the list. Um, and uh, you can still use kind of tombstones in this case, but uh, it's, it's much easier uh, to deal with because nothing needs to be rehashed. So you can add and remove elements, uh, keys from the hash table without having to worry about um, this, this like forward scanning problem that we had with the, the uh, uh, static hash table. So I'll show an example of this, and I think this, this will make sense. So we have uh, these buckets allocated here. Again, we have our keys, and we have this thing called uh, the, the bucket pointer array, or just think of it like a slot array that's going to map um, slots to these buckets that we have stored. So in this case, let's say we want to uh, insert key A, so we're going to hash it to the uh, first bin or a slot in the, the bucket pointer uh, slot array. And that tells us to go into this uh, bucket here. So A goes in, B goes, let's say, in the zeroth uh, bucket there. Uh, let's say C also goes into this bucket with uh, that A is stored in. So essentially we've allocated enough room for two keys, uh, key value pairs in there. And now uh, we have key D. Well, the problem is it, we're out of room here in the, the bucket with A and C in it. So all we, all we need to do is kind of allocate another bucket. Um, and we, we just create basically a linked list where now we've updated this first bu bucket with a pointer to the next bucket uh, in the linked list. And these buckets can be arbitrarily sized. I mean, in the simplest case, it could just be a, a bucket of size one. So you have this kind of linked list chain of individual values. Um, for a, a particular slot in the slot array. Um, 
In this case, it's two. They could be larger. They could be like a page size or something. Uh, and basically, we can just fill up these buckets um, as we go along until until we run out of room, and then we just add a new bucket uh, and connect the the pointer uh, to the next bucket in the linked list. So then, you know, F goes down there. So uh, this is pretty straightforward. Uh, does anyone have any questions about this? Yes. What if instead of a linked list, it was actually like a tree? Would that, what would that be like? So the question is, uh, instead of a linked list, what if you had a tree? Um, that would be fine. I think there's there's no uh, uh, semantic difference other than whatever algorithm you have uh, for searching your your buckets after they come up. So you could maintain a tree. Um, you could maintain another hash table, uh, whatever. But then every time you know you add some layer of complexity like that, there's additional overhead in now. Instead of just uh, inserting something at the end, you know, in the, the, the whatever the next bucket is at the end of the linked list, um, you now need to maintain a tree. And you might have to rebalance the tree so it's sorted or whatever like that, right? So uh, there's trade-offs here. This, this gives you pretty low overhead uh, inserts. You just append something to the end. You don't have to uh, worry too much about the internals of the, the bucket layout. Yes? So the question is, is the length of the bucket pointers list fixed? Yes, the length is fixed. Um, so what's going to happen is, as you increase the number of buckets, you may need to reallocate that uh, ar uh, array to get larger. Um, the, the, the problem, and we'll talk about kind of rebalancing later, but um, if, you, if you just keep the number of buckets fixed and keep adding uh, in this, this uh, uh, linked list fashion here, then you can grow arbitrarily large without having to, to uh, change your bucket pointers. So kind of uh, there's, again, this trade-off between fast inserts versus now if I, if I need to go hash to, let's say, uh, you know, I insert a million more values and they all go in the same bucket as A, C, et cetera. Then in order to find anything, you're going to have to scan this really long linked list. So again, there's this trade-off between um, kind of uh, faster inserts without having to rehash every, any, everything and then um, uh, look up performance. So we'll, we'll see in some of the other schemes how they get around that. Yes? Is it easier to implement a concurrent table with the same hash or Sorry, I didn't get the second part. Uh, so the question is, is it easier to implement a concurrent hash table data structure using chained hashing versus uh, linear probing? Um, I, 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 I don't see any fundamental, or I can't think of any fundamental reason why it would be. Um, I guess you can amortize the cost of an insert. Like you can do these inserts here the same way. Um, so you could just use an atomic, if you wanna you know, stick something in the last slot there, you could just use an atomic um, compare and swap. And then you know, when you, when once E gets in, now you need to, for your next insert, you need to expand the length of the linked list. In the uh, linear probing case, uh, you're sort of doing the same thing, right? You're, you're for every slot, just doing a, an atomic check to see is the slot empty. If not, then move on to the next one. If it is, then you can insert. So I, I don't, I mean, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that there would be any inherent advantage uh, to either one in a concurrent setting. Yes? What about cash performance of this approach? Uh, so the question is, what about the cache performance? So like the CPU cache, I mean? Um, so are, are you asking how does the cache performance of this approach compare to one of the other, like the? Right, so the, the comment is that because it's a linked list, um, it could be random random accesses. The, the nodes could be anywhere in the linked list, so you might have a bunch of skipping around. Um, that's true. I think you can, so in, in the linear probing case, um, 
you just have a scan forward. In this case, you have these linked lists with the pointers you need to follow. Uh, I, there are ways that you can work around it. So for example, uh, if, you, if you make these, these buckets like uh, a large, yeah, so if it's like a large size, like let's say a, a page size or something, then instead of you know, having individual linked list nodes that you have to traverse, you're now traversing something that's like f four kilobytes or something big, or uh, it could be even larger. You can make them arbitrarily large, then there's a trade-off between wasting space and allocation. So kind of there are a lot of trade-offs you have to consider. You could also probably do something with like uh, prefetching if you know that you're, you're scanning to the end of the page, you have to go get the next uh, linked list node in the list. You could issue some kind of prefetching instruction to get that loaded for you uh, so it's ready for uh, when you need it. Great. Okay, so extendable hashing. Um, is, is basically a chained hashing approach where we're going to split the buckets uh, instead of letting the linked list grow forever. So one of the problems with the previous case is that we had you know, linked lists that could become arbitrarily large. If we wanted to stop that, we had to resize that, that bucket slot array thing um, to make it bigger to, to cut down on the um, length of the linked lists, but that kind of defeated the purpose of having this, this uh, dynamic hash table in the first place. So, Kind of the idea of extendable hashing is that we can grow the slot array, uh, the, the mapping array incrementally, um, and we're going to split buckets only when they overflow. And the, the key point here is that multiple slots uh, in the slot array can point to the same bucket chain. Uh, and I'll, I'll show uh, another example here what, what this means. So then you kind of have to reshuffle the, the buckets um, uh, during the split and then we increase the number of bits that we need to examine for the, the split location. So I think this will make sense with this visualization. So this extendable hashing table, we again have this kind of uh, slot array or mapping array um, in, in which we're storing the first two bits or we need to look at the first two bits of each of the, the hash values. So uh, what, uh, what, what the numbers here mean, uh, we have what's called the, the, this global counter which is uh, telling us how many bits we need to care about. And then for each page, um, just, just conceptually, uh, I'm showing the number of bits here. You don't need them for the algorithm, but these are like the, the local count of how many bits we need to care about uh, for each, each page. So what this means is, for example, uh, in, in the first two uh, slots there, 0, 0, and 0, 1, um, if, we, if we look at just the first bits, so that's what the local one means on the first bucket. If we look at just the first bit, we know that those values uh, map to that uh, bucket. In the, the bottom two, we need to look at two bits, and that's why each of their local uh, counters have a two in it. Um, we need to look at two bits to get to each of those. So the, the, the global uh, counter is the, the maximum of all of the, the local counters that we have. So the way that this is going to work is, let's say we want to find key A, and that's going to hash to this values, 0, 1, 1, 0, some other stuff. Um, the way that we're going to do it is we're going to look up the first, the global counter says that we need to look at the first two bits of that hashed value. So we're going to go over here and look at that position in the, uh, the slot array, the mapping array, and it's going to tell us that we need to go to that uh, bucket. So. Similarly, if we want to insert key B and the hash function says it's, you know, one, zero, one, 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 whatever comes after that, uh, then again, the global counter says we have to look at the first two bits. That's going to tell us to go to this position in the mapping array, and it tells us to go to uh, that bucket. So now, finally, if we want to insert key C, uh, again, we get the hash value and we look at the first two bits, and uh, the, the Problem that we're going to see here is that uh, our bucket is now full. So I said kind of there's there's going to be this uh, incremental resizing. So what we need to do is increment our global counter to three now, uh, so that we're looking at the first three bits, and we're going to have to split this bucket that's full into now smaller buckets. So we've uh, incremented the counter. We need to reallocate this array. 
So now we have the first three bits of the numbers. Um, I realize that these are, uh, if you're particularly eagle-eyed, you may notice they're out of order, um, but they're just the values from, from zero to seven. Um, the, the arrows and the animation got too messy, so. Uh, but, but they're just all the values from zero to seven, so you can you know, figure out the slot that you need to go to. Um, and uh, uh, now we, we add a new, split that bucket into two, and we, we redo the mappings. So now, for example, key C, we need to look at, you know, the global counter says look at the first three bits. So we're going to go to that position uh, in the mapping array, and it tells us to go to this uh, bucket there. So I know that it was kind of a little complicated to go through. Um, are there any questions about how this extendable hashing works? Yes. Uh, if we delete a whole bunch of elements, do we ever like uh, shrink the? List? So uh, the question is, if you delete elements, can you shrink the list? Uh, yes. So the the shrinking, uh, we're not going to talk about it here, but shrinking is just like the inverse of of insertion. Um, so you you could shrink the list. Yes. Okay, so linear hashing. Um, what's going to happen is the linear hashing algorithm is going to maintain a pointer that tracks the next bucket to split. So rather than um, uh, splitting a particular bucket, as we did in the previous case, one of the buckets got too full and we split that bucket, um, we, are, we uh, want to split uh, any time that any bucket overflows. And we're going to maintain a pointer to the next bucket that we want to split. So this is going to solve one of the problems with ex uh, extendable hashing was that occasionally, you know, we have to double, end up doubling the size of this uh, uh, mapping array, you know, every time we, we need to add a new uh, bit to consider. Uh, we have to increase the size of the mapping array. So to get around that, uh, linear hashing is going to do it kind of incrementally. So it's going to do the uh, resizing just by adding one new bucket, uh, one new slot in the array at a time. So um, the way that we're going to handle that is by using multiple hash functions. Uh, two is, is sufficient to find the right bucket for a given key. Um, and we're, we can use different overflow criterion, but uh, let's just say it's, it's when the, the size of the bucket fills up. You can use different conditions to decide when to trigger this, but uh, let's, in, in the example in our show, it's just going to be um, when a particular bucket fills up. So what this is going to give you is like a smoother growth policy uh, by splitting, splitting buckets irrespective of, of which one overflows. So you don't run into this, this case where you kind of have to, you know, uh, resize or double the uh, mapping array when uh, individual buckets fill up. So uh, again, here's an example. Um, we have these different uh, array, array buckets, and we have this mapping array. Um, and I mentioned we're going to keep this split pointer that tells us which bucket uh, we want to split next. So the hash function uh, that we're going to start with is just going to say hash function of the key is the key mod t uh, uh, n, which is the, the number of um, buckets that I have. So for example, to find six, we're going to say six mod four is two, and that gives us bucket two to look in, so we're gonna go uh, and retrieve it from that bucket. That's okay. We're gonna insert 17. Well, okay, here we get uh, bucket uh, one that we need to look in. We see bucket one is full, so what we need to do is uh, perform a split uh, in order to do uh, the, the uh, incremental resizing that we that uh, we want to perform. So again, the split pointer keeps track of the bucket that we're going to split, not necessarily the one that got too big. So the first thing we need to do is add this overflow bucket, um, similar to the the uh, the chained hashing that we had. So 17 goes in there. Uh, the first part is done, but now we need to do uh, the splitting. So. The split pointer points to this first bucket. We're going to uh, split that bucket into two. And we're going to add a new uh, slot on the end, so slot number four. And we're going to create this new hash function that's now Q 
key mod 2n, so double the n. So we rerun all of the keys in that first bucket, 8 and 20. 8 still lands in the first bucket. 20 now goes into this uh, uh, new bucket that we've created. And then we're going to advance our split pointer. So now what's going to happen is for all of the uh, uh, subsequent calls, we need to decide whether the keys are above or below this, this split pointer line. So in this case, we have key 20. Uh, if we come in here and we try and use you know, the original hash function, uh, it's going to say that we should go to bucket 0. That's going to be a problem because we split that bucket and we moved key 20 to this uh, bucket 4. So we need to keep track of this line and we need to say, okay, is the key that we're looking for, if we perform the first hash function, is it above or below uh, the line? So if it's above the line, in this case like 20, we know that we need to rerun using the second hash function and we end up um, correctly down in this, this bottom uh, new bin that we've added. So now if we want to find a, another key like key 9, so that, that uh, winds us up at the bucket 1 there, we know that that's below the split pointer line. So all we need to do is uh, uh, go and look it up in that table. So what's going to happen is uh, over time, uh, we're going to keep moving this split pointer line down, keep splitting buckets. Eventually, this one that's overflowed here will, will uh, split up when some other bucket fills up, we need to split it until we again wrap around. You can think of this like a circular buffer. So we get down to the bottom when we're done, We've essentially doubled the size of the array. We'll start again at the beginning and we can get rid of the first um, uh, hash function, hash one, and replace that with hash two. Then we're back to kind of the, the same place we started. So uh, kind of the idea is that we're splitting buckets based on the split pointer. Eventually we get to all of the overflowed buckets. Um, and then when we reach the last slot, you know, we, we uh, loop around and, and get back to the beginning. Uh, are there any quick questions about that? Great. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, kind of the, the hash tables that we talked about today are fast data structures. They support O1 lookups, uh, which, you know, the, the uh, time complexity, space complexity are important. But again, we really care about, uh, or we care a lot about the um, uh, constants that are associated with them. Um, they're used all throughout DBMS internals. We have these different trade-offs we need to consider between uh, speed and flexibility. But hash tables are usually not what you want to use uh, for a table index. So they have a lot of uses, in particular for things like joins or other intermediates, uh, maybe for tracking metadata. But usually for table indexes, what you want to use is what we'll talk about next class, uh, B plus trees, um, which are, have been described by some as the greatest data structure of all time. Um, I happen to share that opinion. Uh, and I'm really excited for uh, Wednesday's lecture. So I will see you all on Wednesday. Talking about the St. Ives brew, run through a can or two. Share with my crew is magnificent. Plus it's mellow. And for the rest of the commercial, I pass the mic on to my no fellow. Need for a mic check, plus it. The fees are set to grab a 40. The flim the yoga snap is next. St. Ives. Take a sip and wipe your lips. Cue my 40's getting warm. I'm out, he got the dip. Drink it, drink it, drink it, then I burp. After I slurp, ice cube, I put in much work. With the BMT and the E-Trouble, get us a St. Ives brew on the double.